Hello, everybody. Welcome back to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to talk about a unique power converter topology since we just recently talked about flyback converters and we often talk about buck converters on this channel. We're going to show a fusion between the two called a fly buck converter. A fly buck converter is basically a combination between a flyback topology and a buck converter topology. I'm going to show you how it works, talk about some of the advantages, and of course, talk to you about how to set up the grounding strategy on your PCB if you need galvanic isolation. Let's get started. So in this video, we'll be talking about the fly buck converter. And just before we get started with this, let's quickly review the two topologies that we're combining. So first with a fly back, we have a DC input. We bring that over to a transformer. We have a FET here, and this then goes down to ground. We generally have a snubber here. The snubber is essentially just a parallel RC circuit with a diode here. And then this induces a current in a secondary coil over here on this side. We have a diode, and then we have a capacitor here, and then we have our output voltage. So this is our typical flyback converter. Now with a buck converter, we also have a DC input. We bring this over to a FET. We have a PWM signal here. Over here, we then have usually a diode, but then we could also have another FET. And then we have the PWM signal also going here. And then this comes over to our inductor and then a capacitor. And then of course this wraps back around and all of this goes to ground. So this is our buck converter and this is our flyback converter. So a fly buck converter essentially fuses these two topologies right here at this inductance. So what I mean is we can implement the type of isolated topology that we see here where we could have a separate ground net, let's call this SGND, that we have here in the flyback converter over here in our buck converter. So by doing that, what we're actually doing is we are taking this inductor and then we can replace it with this transformer so that this primary coil right here, LP, then forms our primary coil over here in the buck converter, LP. So here the inductance that we would use normally in the flyback converter is then also exploited as the inductance here in our buck converter. Using a transformer in the buck converter gives us a totally different topology. And we can then couple another pulse over to an output side and have a secondary rail in our buck converter. Now our fly buck converter would basically look something like this. We have our first switching element and that goes to our PWM signal. We have our second switching element or our rectifying element that's over here. This is also going to our PWM signal. And then we have a ground over here. Now here on the primary side, we have our first coil in our transformer. And this can induce power to the secondary coil in our transformer. Our other transformer over here can then have a diode for rectification. And then we go out over here to a capacitor and then we have our output on this rail. So we have V out and we'll call this rail one. Over here, we have essentially our standard buck converter configuration where we have an output capacitor and then we have V out two. So what we've done here is we've taken a DC input and this could be a very high DC input. We've then stepped this down with the standard buck converter topology using a PWM signal. So this switching PWM signal is then going to determine the value of V out two over here on our primary rail. The switching signal then induces a voltage V out one over here on this secondary rail. Now this secondary rail is important because of course we can just step down this voltage to this voltage just by taking advantage of the turns ratio between these two coils. So here I have an LP value and I have an LS value. And of course the turns ratio NP over NS squared is equal to LP 
over LS. So this is how you would then design for the inductances that you want to have between these two coils in the transformer. So your LP value is going to determine, of course, the ripple in this uh, output voltage number two. And then the LS value is going to determine the ripple on output voltage for rail one. It's also going to determine the value of this voltage here. So it's this turns ratio that then is going to help determine what this output uh, voltage is on the secondary side. So this is a great topology for generating two different voltage rails with a single switching converter or a switching circuit. So here, I can essentially just set these two values just with the transformer, and they're always gonna have the same ratio. So whenever I start to adjust the PWM signal on this input side, I'm going to adjust it proportionally on this output side. So I can essentially maintain the same ratio between these two output voltages. So you might be wondering, could I have another coil that is coupled to LP in a transformer that then creates a third rail in this topology? And the answer is yes, you could. You could technically have as many rails as you can possibly fit onto that transformer. So here you could have a third rail, which has another inductance, L sub T, and now the ratio of LP to LT is gonna determine the value of this output voltage, V out three. So I can have as many rails as I like or as I can possibly fit into this transformer. Now in a practical sense, you're gonna be limited to the number of rails that you can stick onto a transformer because eventually that transformer gets very physically large in order to make room for the windings that you need to then uh, be able to build that transformer with multiple coils so that you can couple to all of these different rails. So you are limited in a practical sense, but in theory, you could extend this to as many rails as you want. Because you need very precise coupling with these different turns ratios between all of these different rails, this generally requires a custom transformer. So you're not normally gonna find something off the shelf that is just going to work so easily. Maybe you could couple down close to V out three and then put this through an LDO. Same thing maybe with V out one. So you can get a little creative as far as how you reach the final voltage on this secondary and tertiary rail. But in general, if you wanna step down to a very precise voltage, what you're gonna to have to do is get a custom transformer that has all of these different ratios of LP to LS and LP to LT that you want. So the next thing you should notice about this is because we have a transformer here and there's no direct contact between these two coils, you could actually set up an isolated system with this type of power converter. So that's really valuable too. What I can do is I can essentially have a gap between these two with two totally separate ground planes between these. So I could basically have, let's say in the case of two rails, I have here my main primary ground. But over here on this output, I could have a secondary ground, we'll call it SGND that is galvanically isolated from this first ground. Now, typically, of course, you would then want to also then have uh, your secondary ground, SGND, connected to your primary ground through like a Y-type capacitor. You wanna then check, of course, the leakage on this capacitor to make sure that you don't have excessive current traveling through the secondary side over to some output where a person might interact with it because there are EMC regulations that limit that. But you would generally set up the system like this if you wanted to have galvanic isolation between this ground and this portion of the system. Now you don't have to do this. I could theoretically just have a single ground on this side as well. And then I wouldn't have this portion in my system either. So in this case, I would lose that galvanic isolation but now I don't have a ground offset between these two sides of this power converter. So if you want galvanic isolation and you have a secondary ground like this, you would then have physically separate ground regions on the PCB. So this allows you to put a totally separate set of components on the PCB that are totally isolated from this first set of components. And when I say totally isolated, I mean whatever you're powering on the secondary side can't have any traces that travel back over to this primary side unless you use another coupling transformer 
or unless you use an optocoupler. So we've talked a little bit about that in the past when I believe we discussed feedback loops and power converters, and we talked about optocouplers generally. So make sure you understand how to use those components because that's how you would get any information such as digital signals from this secondary side back over to this primary side. So one of the challenges with this type of design is how do you control feedback and how do you get feedback from either of these sides back over to the primary where you have this switching controller? Well, I think the safest way to do this is to simply assume that you're gonna have a constant ratio between output one and output two based on the inductances and the duty cycle. So that's the first point. But the second point here to understand is where do you route that feedback loop? Well, typically in this type of uh, voltage converter, what you would do is you would have essentially a feedback loop that looks something like this. So I have two resistors, this is going to ground, and then this would come back to the feedback pin on whatever PWM-based uh, controller I have. So all of those uh, buck converter or boost converter controller ICs that you see that use feedback, they will have a feedback pin on them. And generally what you do is you take the output voltage, drop it over a voltage divider that uses very large resistors, and then the uh, current that travels into this feedback pin biases that feedback pin. And then the voltage measurement that you use here is compared with a silicon band gap reference that's used to then adjust the PWM signal so that you maintain a constant target output voltage. With this type of converter, I think it's best to just do it from the primary side. You could theoretically do it from the secondary side and then you would bias an optocoupler to get this signal back over here, but you don't have to do it. Just do the simple thing, get your uh, output voltage measurement on the primary side and use that for feedback and stable regulation. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. This is everything that you need to know to get started designing your own Flybuck converter. Make sure to check out the link in the description. There's a link to a blog that goes over some of the finer points for designing this type of power converter, including some of design equations. Thanks everybody again for watching. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and of course, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. Last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.